we don't have enough addresses to represent every machine. So what we can do is we can kind of uh, fake things out. Um, and so that's where you get uh, NAT happening. NAT is network address translation. It's allowing this bit of the network to stay as it is using IPv4, even while we've got too many computers connected to actually fit within the IPv4 address space. This prefix here, which always refers to the first 16 bits, 128.243, has been handed out to the University of Nottingham. So University of Nottingham computers will typically be, I don't know if we have other prefixes, but certainly many of them will be within that prefix. Let's imagine that you've got, you know, the University of Nottingham is sort of on that side, this line. We could have lots and lots and lots and lots of computers behind here. If we can translate the addresses for each of these machines, so that they can fit within 128.243.something.something. We can sort of pretend to the rest of the world that this prefix contains enough addresses for us, while we've got lots of machines behind that, all kind of using and reusing addresses within that space. And that was one of those things which was kind of just done as a hack to make things work because it was just necessary. And so there's lots of idiosyncrasies in the ways that different implementations of it work and it wasn't sort of standardized in advance and then there was a nice set of rules everybody, everybody could follow. People just kind of made it work and then retrospectively looked at it and gone, kind of what have we done here? We've got some data in our packet and we've got a TCP header and we've got an IP header. Okay, what NAT does is it uses some of the bits in the TCP header and uses them essentially to extend the address space for the IP addresses. The particular bits it uses are what's called the port numbers. And in particular, uh, it uses the source port very commonly. So the idea with that is that when you're talking to another application on the internet, so your web browser is talking to a web server, for example, it indicates that by putting a value in the destination port number. And it's that which gets used by the receiving computer to work out which application should get given this data. So for web servers, commonly, that will be port 80 and port 443 maybe one or two others, but those are the two standard ones. So port 80 is usually used for carrying web traffic, carrying HTTP. Um, it's just a convention, doesn't have to be, carry anything else you like on that. But that's the indicator that's used by the receiving machine to say which application gets this data. And that's the destination port. Now the source port is used by the receiving machine to know where to send the response back to. But can be manipulated along the way, providing that manipulation can be kind of undone on the way back. So there might be a machine here, at the kind of at the gateway, the University of Nottingham network, which is able to say, okay, we've got far too many machines here to fit inside this space. We're gonna to have to map the address of, let's say this machine 10.0.0.10. All the machines on the internet know how to get to 128.243. something. And so we need to convert this address here into an address that fits inside there. So what we could do is we could set up a little table and it could say, okay, 10.0.0.10 on this side, this gateway machine here is gonna convert that into 128.243.20.20. And that's fine and that'll work, but that means we still only have this many slots. So what it could also do is it could say, okay, well, how about I also rewrite the source port number as well, so that when it says source port 32,621, I'm gonna remap that to source port 16. And so what we've got here is we're, we're looking at taking all of this data and remapping it into that. And because each machine here will typically not be using the maximum possible number of connections, you end up with the ability to fit more machines activity into the same number of addresses. This is called multiplexing, when you're taking more things and fitting them into a smaller thing, essentially. So on the way out, this translation happens in that direction. Then on the way back, it has to be translated back in the other direction. So that something out here, you know, the server that you were trying to get to over here, is sending stuff back to 128.243.2020, destination port 16, and then it's this gateway here is the only thing in the world that knows that that really maps to this particular machine and that particular application on that particular machine. And so you've got this translation that happens in one direction and you have to undo the translation in the other direction to be able to get back to it. And that's what makes this complex. How does that equate to, say, me sitting at home on my broadband? So it's exactly the same process, modulo the particular details of how 
NAT is working in that particular device, but basically it's the same process. So inside your home network, for example, if you have a look at the IP addresses of any of your devices, you might see that they'll often start with 10. So it'll be 10.0. something or 10.1. something, or they'll start with 192.168. something, or in some cases they may start with 172. something. It's a bit rarer. Um, and those addresses, all of those sets of addresses, are what's called private addresses. So you never see them on the public internet. They're only for use behind one of these devices in a private network. And then it's your home router that does the translation for you. Each router in a home has actually has a unique address. It's not been done by the ISP then, this translation. Well, so what's happening is you've got a router sitting in your home, and that's connected by a cable to your ISP's network. There will be a public address on this side of the cable. Um, and then on this side inside your home, you've got all these private addresses. And then there's the, the public address here. And it's this router here that's doing this process for all of your private addresses, so your laptop, your iPad, your phone, whatever it is that you've got inside um, your house. All of their accesses out to the network are getting translated um, so that your ISP, which then connects through to usually many other uh, bigger networks, um, and eventually you know, to somebody like Google or something, as far as your ISP is concerned, They've been given a certain amount, a certain number of addresses, and they're using those addresses to support many people, each of whom have many, many computers, perhaps. And so these layers of translation are happening in order that your data can get through to Google, and Google's response, can, or whoever it might be, Microsoft's response, can get back to you, um, all the while without having enough of these IP addresses to cover every single household's use of all of these computers. So that translation is happening everywhere. It's allowing this bit of the network to stay as it is using IPv4 even while we've got too many computers connected to actually fit within the IPv4 address space. NAT makes the network less robust. You've now ended up with sort of single points. So this guy here, for example, this router here, is the only thing that knows how to do this translation. And so if that fails, stuff stops working. It's more complex to kind of set up backups and things because they have to now share all this information that's got to be maintained, that's got to be maintained in that place. You've also got problems to do with the complexity this introduces. So you can have situations perhaps where your network might also be doing this same process when it talks to other networks, because your network's not been able to get enough addresses for all the customers it's got. And so you've got this translation happening in multiple places and it becomes difficult then for somebody to debug what's going on. So if things aren't working quite right, but you've got all these different layers of translation, it becomes quite complex to see what's happening. If you believe this sort of strict picture where you've got Ethernet at the bottom, you've got IP above that, you've got TCP above that, you've got, let's say, HTTP above that. So this is the protocol that the, the web uses. You believe that really strictly. There should be no cases where information from down here is being used directly to do things at this layer. There should be no cases where information at this layer is being used directly to do things at that layer. These abstractions should be maintained. But in practice, they're not for a variety of reasons, many good engineering reasons in some cases. When you start doing things like that, Another protocol might have been relying on knowing the source address, for example. When the source address gets changed under its feet without it knowing about it, you end up with a situation where somewhere in the data in the packet, you've got the source address 10.0.0.10, and then in the header by the NAT machine, that's been changed to 128.243.20.20, and suddenly these things don't match anymore. So when you're trying to connect to a, another computer, this is the address that's used, and that's fine, it gets you to the right computer. But then when the software in that computer tries to refer to the address that the packet came from, it ends up having to use this address, and that's no longer the right address. And so that protocol is brittle in the face of this kind of manipulation, because it's now not going to work quite correctly. So this was uh, this particular problem with internet telephony. You may want to set up a connection between two machines, which are both in, somebody's, in different people's houses, behind this kind of translation. When the first machine tries to essentially place a phone call to the second machine, what address should it use? Because it can't know which of these 10 dot addresses or 192 addresses it is, because that translation is going to be maintained by the NAT box that's sitting in the home gateway of that house, the home router of that house. And so it doesn't know what that translation is yet. And so it's got no way to refer to the particular phone it wants to ring inside that house. And so there's then a whole bunch of other protocols that had to be developed to try and allow that kind of situation to be resolved where you wanted to get essentially kind of have those two machines rendezvous to exchange information about what their current private addresses are and what their current public facing addresses are according to the NAT 
process that's run in front of them so that the guy making the call can use the right public address to try and get the packets through to the right place in the network. The protocols running above, which previously could assume that if they looked at the IP, their source IP address, it really would be their source IP address and everybody else could reach that, and so they could always use that. Um, now they can't. And that assumption then breaks the way those protocols, the breaking of that assumption breaks those protocols. Each of these different layers provides a different set of abstractions. It sort of builds on the abstractions provided by whatever's below it, and it provides some abstraction to the thing above it. For example, if you look at an Ethernet header, essentially you've got a sequence of stuff on there. So you start out with the destination address, uh, then you have a source address, and then depending on precisely the version of Ethernet you're running, you have some information about the protocol of what's coming next. 